Good morning, church. Let's stand together. Raise a hallelujah to Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's lift it up. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah.
darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I owe when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken it's my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind, oh, oh, I won't be shaken, no, I won't be shaken, if my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance.
And Lord, we're just thrilled to come into your house today. We want to hear from you. We pray that you would do what you want to do in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Well, believe it or not, already today is January 8th, which means we're five days away from what's referred to annually as National Quitters Day. You say, I have no idea, no idea what that means. National Quitters Day is the day that over 70% of people will abandon their New Year's resolution. And we are in church today, so you cannot lie. Let's be honest. How many are already done? Yeah, yeah. I walked into our house a couple of days ago, and my wife had a bag of potato chips in, in her lap, and I went, so we're finished. She goes, we're finished. I'm like, yes! We tried. We're out. Now, this is the time of year that we all have a, a season of renewal. It's a, it's a period where we're going to take a moment, we're going to evaluate the things that we've been doing, that we should stop doing, the things that we aren't doing, that we should be doing. We take inventory. We take inventory of our heart and uh, of our health, of our fitness, of our finances, of our habits, of our relationship. And then we make these commitments to ourselves, to each other. We say, this year I'm going to eat better. I'm going to save more. I'm going to watch less TV. I'm going to spend more time with our, our family. Whatever, whatever, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, some of you uh, maybe are like me. You get to an age where you go, I know me. So I'm not even going to make a resolution because I just know it's not going to last. Like, I, I've gotten to a place where I go, I'm not even going to lie to myself. I'm not even going to try. And that's okay. But believe it or not, the Bible tells us that God invites us to a place, a season of renewal. That I believe that part of the reason why we have years the way we do is because it's an opportunity for us to hit the reset button. It's an opportunity. I believe that's why God gives us new years. I believe that's why he gives us new weeks because we go, that was last week, this is this week, that was last year, this is this year. And God invites us to come to a place to renew our faith because we, not God, but because we have a tendency to drift. I shared last week, I said, if we're not careful, there, there's a tendency for us to become a card-carrying member of Christianity who based on a baptism years ago or based on the fact that we attend church, we, we think that we're part of the faith by simply something. Without realizing it, what, what actually happens is we become cold. This is something that we, we see true throughout history. We see it true under the old covenant. One of the stories that's just uh, kind of mind-numbing to me, uh, you remember the story of Samson and, and Judges. Samson is this incredible man used by God, flowing in the power and strength of God. And all of a sudden, uh, things start to change. He, he starts to grow cold, and he doesn't even know it. And, and the Bible says that all of a sudden, the Philistines come upon him, and Delilah says to him, Samson, the, the Philistines, they're, they're here. And, and the Bible says that Samson woke up. And he thought, well, I'll just go out like I have before and I'll shake myself free. But, but here's the thing. It says this, but he did not know that the spirit of the Lord had left him. This man who once walked in power and strength didn't even recognize that God was no longer with him. And sadly, that's what happens to us sometimes. We just kind of rely. We just kind of go through the motions we see even under the new covenant, this instruction of, of renewal. Peter says this, he says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling, your election. For if we do these things, you'll never stumble, and you'll receive a rich welcome into the kingdom, and into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, so yes, it's natural for us to, to, to contend for better health or better finances or more time with our friends, but it's more important for us to set aside a season, the beginning of the year, to consider, and not just for ourselves, but to invite the Holy Spirit to come and give an assessment, give an inventory, what things in your life belong, what things need to be added, what things need to be taken away, renewing our commitment to God. I want to take a look at a story in the New Testament that I think is one of the best to helping us renew our commitment to Jesus. The passage we're going to look at are the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 5. I just want to set it up for a moment because what was happening at this point in history is this. Jesus had been walking, leading. He had his disciples. He had his followers. He had the multitudes. And all of a sudden, people started to make distinctions. 
They see, they see Jesus and his disciples, and, and then they look at John the Baptist and his disciples, and they look at the Pharisees and, and their followers, and, and they just came to this conclusion. They, they came with this question, and they, and they bring the question to Jesus, and the question essentially is this. They say, Jesus, how come when we look at John the Baptist and his disciples, they fast regularly? And the Pharisees and their followers, they fast regularly, but you and your disciples, well, you don't fast. And Jesus' response is, is great. He says this. He says, you cannot make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? He says, but those days are coming when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and at that time they will fast. You say, what does that mean? What, what was he saying? What Jesus was doing there, he's making a distinction that his arrival had changed everything. See, up to this point, the reason why in the Old Testament covenant people were fasting, the, the reason they were, they were praying is they were, they were remaining diligent and looking for the coming of the Messiah. Jesus says this. He says, I'm here. My presence is changing the practice of the Old Testament covenant. And for now, it won't be needed. So in other words, he says this. He says, I'm sitting next to you, so there's no reason to fast for my arrival because I'm here. Now, later we'll see, he's going to say there'll come a season, the season we're in, that we return back to prayer and fasting because we're waiting for his arrival again. But he says, not right now. See, he, he, he's saying that there is a change that's occurring here from the old covenant to the new covenant. And people are having such a difficulty understanding this. We'll see, even as we go into the New Testament, with Paul, a lot of Paul's writings is responding to individuals going, but we're trying to hold on to the law. We're trying to hold on to the old covenant. And Paul goes, no, no, that has passed. The new has come. And they're trying to be diligent. They're, they're trying to follow the rules of the old where Jesus says, no, no, no. My arrival changed things. But it was difficult. It was difficult for the people to grasp. And, and this concept of spiritual renewal for sometimes is difficult for us to grasp. So Luke records that Jesus goes on and tells a parable. He says this. He says, No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. If he does, he will have torn the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And then he'll say this, and he says, And no one pours new wine into old wineskin. If he does, the new wine will burst the skin, and it will spill, and the skins will be destroyed. In the context here, uh, what Jesus is doing is he's speaking about the dangers of trying to merge the old to the new covenant. But the principles apply even to us when we talk about here renewing our faith. God calls us to renew our faith because, quite frankly, we become stale. We become stale. We have a tendency to, to go through the motions to mail it in. For, for many of you, hopefully, when you started your spiritual journey, and we'll talk more about this in the second and third point, but, but when you started your spiritual journey, somebody discipled you, someone was your mentor, your accountability partner, and they said, okay, here's the steps on how you develop, how you mature in your spiritual faith, and, and they laid down for you spiritual disciplines. They'll say, hey, one of the first things you need to do is, is come to church regularly. That's where you're going to learn. That's where you're going to grow. That's where you're going to build community, and they're going to, then they're going to teach you how to pray. And they're going to teach you how to study God's word on their own. And they're going to teach you how to give. And they're going to teach you how to serve. And then uh, all of a sudden, they're going to teach you how to fast. And, and you're going to advance in, in your spiritual disciplines. And all of this is right. All this is proper. All this is part of being a follower of God. But, but here's the challenge. As we do this over a course of months and years and decades for some of us, it's possible for us to become so routine in what we do that the power of why we're doing it is gone. I'll say it in other ways. It's possible for you to come here every single week, sing the songs off the wall, give in the offering, hug someone and call somebody brother, serve in the children's ministry, jump through all the right hoops. It's possible for you to pray and read your Bible. I got my devotion. I do my devotion every day. And your heart be far from God. You can do all the right things and lose the reason that you're doing it. And we do the same thing. So we're going to look at today three requirements of spiritual renewal. I'm going to share one of them, and then Pastor Lane is going to come and, and share the, the, the second two. But the first one is this. For those of you taking notes, uh, renewal here is reflective. 
The first step in renewal is to determine, is to look back and to go, let's see what's not working anymore. It may have worked at one time, but it's not working any longer. It's to discover what are the things that we're just holding on to because that's what we do. That's what we were told to do. And so we're just doing it. We're just doing it. We're just doing it. And we think we're checking off the spiritual box and we think that somehow God is pleased. Uh, so the first step of renewal is reflective, and this could actually be the most important step in the entire process. Let me illustrate it in a physical standpoint. I have been told that if you do the same exercise week after week, month after month, that eventually your body will adjust and you'll have no results. That at first you'll go, this works. I'm sore, I'm tired, I'm seeing definition, I'm seeing strength. If you do the same thing over a period of time, eventually your body will adjust. There'll be benefits, but it won't be as beneficial as it was when it started. So people will tell you, they'll say, you have to crossfit, you have to run and swim, you have to, you have to do whatever and lift, you have to cycle, you have, you have to mix it up, you have to shock your body into something else where your body adjusts and then all of a sudden something new turns on and all of a sudden you're working different muscle groups or, or whatever. If you keep doing the same thing, it's good but you're not going to get the same results, the same benefits as you would at the beginning. The same with us spiritually. Friends, I want to tell you that in this coming year, I believe in my gut that God has something new for you. Something new. Something new for this congregation. New wine. New wine skins. And we need to experience the newness of God. And in order for that to happen, we need to allow God to stretch us. We need to get rid of the, the rigid things that, that have held us back, the, the old styles, the old habits. Now, Jesus goes on. He says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the, and the skins will be destroyed. Instead, new wine must be poured into new wine, wineskins. Catch this. Because no one drinking old wine wants the new, for they say what? The old is good enough. Why would he say that? Because all of us have a tendency to develop taste. We develop routines. We develop patterns that, that once they're set, we say we, don't know any, we, we, we no longer need any change. And in that, we lose passion. We lose power. Things just become rote to us. Let me give you an example. I've shared this example before, but I think it's a perfect one here. Uh, in my house, we have a tendency, uh, a practice, when, when my family's together, and sadly, they're not together as much as they used to be. I got a 16-year-old and 20-year-old, but when our family's together, we pray before a meal. That's, just, that's like a good all-American Christian thing to do, right? We pray before a meal. And, and this is what happens, and, and I don't want you to think less of my family, but this is just the honest and truth. What happens in our family when it's time to pray, there's usually a little bit of discussion, a little bit of argument, because nobody wants to pray. I've been in some families, they'll do one of these things. And I'll go, what's that? And the last person to put their pinky up has to pray, as if prayer is a punishment. Right? Like, oh, okay, I wasn't paying attention, I guess I'll pray. And then in my house, they want me to pray, and I have to explain to them, I said, I get paid to pray, so if you want me to pray, it's going to cost you. I mean, you get what you pay for, so if you want a professional prayer over this meal, pass the plate for good, you guys know how this works, no. But, but here's the deal. Then even when we pray, we have a tendency to just kind of fall into a routine of prayer, Say, God is good, God is great, let us thank him for this food, amen. And you may not say the exact same thing, but we have a tendency, we just kind of pray through the, through the same routine of prayer. And, and here's the thing, am I saying that praying is wrong? No. But we forget the reason why we're praying. Why do we say grace before a meal? Because we go, God, we recognize that you are the one who provides we take a moment in, in gratitude to say thank you that you are our source. That we recognize that there's many people around the world that, that much less uh, uh, don't get three meals a day. They don't get one meal like the meal we're having. Like, like a meal for us is like Thanksgiving for everybody. You know what I'm saying? We miss the point of why we're praying in the first place. We're doing the right thing. We're doing the, 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 the ritualistic thing. 
we're praying, we're, we're acknowledging the right person, we're saying, thank you, God, we pray this in Jesus' name, we're, 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 we're jumping through all the right hoops, but there's no meaning, there's no purpose, there's no passion, there's no life behind, we're just doing it because that's what we do. That's why we need renewal. So renewal has to be reflective. You've got you to invite the Holy Spirit to go, what things like the Pugner's prayer issues, what, what things in my life need to change? Where has my spiritual life become like old wineskin? Uh, what is it in my spiritual life that has stayed the same? It's become ritualistic. It's become a pattern, and it's not, it's not really yielding any results. So much so, a couple of weeks ago, my we asked my son to pray, and he prayed like a real meaningful prayer of sincerity. We all just kind of stopped and went, wow, Briggs, that was nice. Like we just, I mean, sadly, that wasn't the norm in our family. We just went, wow, that was really, that was really good. Huh. I believe as we begin this week, as we begin this year, we ask God the question, are there things that need to change? Because if we don't, we won't experience what God wants to do because we're used to the old wine. We say, oh, the old wine tastes better. And my concern for you and my concern for me is that there comes a place in the spiritual journey like Samson where the spirit of the Lord has left us and we just do what we do because that's what good all-American Christian people do now. The Bible talks about us going back to our first love. That's renewal. Just a second, Lane's going to come and give us the next two points, but uh, I, I want to just invite us to, could you just stand with me for a moment, and we're, we're going to go back into a time of worship. And in this time of worship, this is an opportunity for you to just say in your own way, God, I'm inviting renewal to come into my life. I, I, I'm inviting your Holy Spirit to help me reflect back, to look back and to go, what things need to change? We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to help us take new steps for new wine. Let's worship the Lord together.
seated. A few nights ago, I went out for a run, and I overdid it. Like, seriously overdid it. Let me explain to you how this came about. At the turn of the year, a buddy of mine and I were texting back and forth about our running last year, and we were sharing some of our accomplishments and our distances, and then that turned into a little bit of male bravado challenges of, well, what do you think you're going to do this year? And it went back and forth. And then we kind of landed on this number. We challenged each other on a certain number that we said, do you think you can hit this by December 31st of 2023? And I said, easy, not easy, easy. And he said, well, then put, this is, put some money against it. <laughs> we agreed on a Venmo account. Money was promised. Then there were quarterly payouts other people wanted to get in on it, and before I knew it, I had committed myself to this distance challenge for this year that there is not a way in the world I'm going to hit, but I'm in, because it's either I hit the number or I pay out, and I would rather hit the number than pay out. So I got up one night, or it was one night, about nine o'clock at night, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go out for a run. It was warm. It was nice. I said, I'm, I can do this. I'm good at this. So I went out and I ran way further, way further than I should have that night. And as I came back, all my runs end within about, I don't know, about a tenth of a mile from my house. I always kind of stopped there. And as I stopped, I instantly went lightheaded, like as in like this kind of a thing. See stars, and I thought, this isn't good. <laughs> and I got as far as our mailbox, and again, this is night, it's dark, cars are coming down our street, and I just conveniently used the mailbox I know you haven't heard this part of the story yet. Uh, I conveniently use this part of the mailbox to just kind of steady myself as if I'm checking the mail at 9 o'clock at night, just kind of hanging out. And I'm looking at our front door going, I just need to make it to the front door, and I'm okay. And so I stood there and went, I think I got this straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line. Walked in the house. When I walked in the house, my family looked at me, and they're like, 
what is wrong with you? And I was like, don't talk, don't talk. And I just laid in the floor and stared at the ceiling. And instantly my family realized that they were caught between two equally valid decisions. Call an ambulance or kill me for my stupidity. They kind of leaned this way and then they started seeing some of the blood come back into my face. See, here's the problem. The problem is, is that leading up to that run, over the days leading up to it, my diet had consisted predominantly of gummy bears and coffee. <laughs> not the breakfast of champions, not the breakfast of champions, but I just had not really been that diligent in my eating the days leading up to it, and I paid for it. You see, runners, specifically serious runners, I'm not one of those, but in the running world, there are religious disciplines. There are certain things that runners are incredibly, incredibly religious about. And being hydrated and having actually fuel in your body, those are two of them. Runners go, they know when they're going to eat, they know what they're going to eat, they know the frequency of their eating. They are very, very, very religious about those disciplines. I had ignored all of those on the nutrition side, and I paid for it dearly. I ignored the religion of the runner. We have a tendency to ignore the religion of renewal. We have a tendency to ignore the religion of our faith, and we pay for it. And that's the second point this morning, is that renewal is, whether you realize this or not, renewal is religious. Renewal is religious. Now, the problem is, is that that word gets an incredibly bad rap in our society, specifically in the church. People think of religion or religious in completely negative terms. We think of religion as stale forms of church or just stodgy attitudes and behaviors in people, which is why decades ago, the church kind of coined this phrase. They, they, they came up with this phrase, which is, Christianity is not religious, or Christian, uh, Christianity is not about being religious, it's about relationship. And people said it all the time, I'm not religious, I just have a relationship. And look, the heart of that phrase is fine, I get the heart of it. But there are dangers on that side as well. There are dangers on the side of thinking that Christianity is nothing more than just all the warm fuzzies of having Jesus as your best friend. Yes, it's a relationship, but we cannot lose the truth that there are, in fact, requirements to our faith. There are disciplines to the faith. In fact, in the scriptures, the predominant word used to define those that follow Jesus, disciple, that word is the root word of the word discipline. To be a disciple of Jesus means that you practice the discipline of following him. There are requirements. And in fact, the scriptures, the scriptures, while we may think the word religion or the word religious is negative, the scriptures don't. The scriptures simply make a distinction between religion and religious versus ritual. Religion versus Ritual. L let me explain it to you. James, in his text, he actually talks about people who think they're religious, but he says that they show through the lack of discipline and something as small as their speech that their religion is actually completely hollow. James chapter 1, here's what he says. He says, if someone thinks he's religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, and so deceives his heart, his what? Religion is futile. Uh, Paul kind of echoes the exact same sentiment. Paul writes that in the last days, we will see people who have all the outward signs of the faith, all the outward signs of being a Christian, he says, but they won't have any of the power to go with it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says they will maintain these people, he says they're going to maintain the outward appearance of, again, religion, but they will have repudiated its power. In both of these passages... I want to call your attention to it. Neither James nor Paul speaks badly or negatively about the concept of religion or about being religious. Instead, for them, the problem is people who claim to be followers of Christ but lack the actual discipleship or the discipline 
that's supposed to go with it. That's what the term religious simply means. Someone who is passionate about the requirements. Pick anything that you are remotely interested in as a hobby. Car repair, fishing, running, exercise, whatever the case is. And I will guarantee you that if it's a serious hobby to you, I can make the case that you are religious about the disciplines that go with it. I have never, ever, 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 ever in my life, even though a majority of my family loves to hunt, I've never, ever, ever felt the need to go shoot something. But my family, cousins and nephews that I have, they're up at 4 o'clock in the morning to sit in a tree. That's religious. That's religion. There are disciplines. There's a time you get up. There's a time you have to be there. They understand it. The word religious, the word Religion is not negative. It simply means somebody who absolutely is passionate about the requirements to see a result. On the night of my run, I had the appearance of a runner, but I did not have the endurance. I didn't have the stamina. I didn't have the power. Why? Because I was not religious about the disciplines. And in the faith, Paul and James write that there are people who have the appearance of religion but they're not really religious. Go back to our story in Luke that Brian started us with. Jesus says that his disciples aren't fasting when he's there. He says it's basic. He says the fasting and praying under the old covenant is fasting and praying that God would send the Messiah. So now that I'm here, why would you fast now that I'm here? I'm here so you, there's no need to right now because if you fast while I'm here, he says, then you're just doing it out of Ritual. That's the problem. He says, but once I leave again, he says, then my disciples will go back to it, not out of ritual, but because they will be religious about wanting to see my return again. And that's exactly what they do. Look at Luke's recording this in Acts chapter 13. Luke says that while they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted and prayed and placed their hands on them, they sent them off. Acts chapter 14, when they had appointed elders for them in the various churches with prayer and fasting, they entrusted them to the protection of the Lord in whom they had believed. See the difference? The disciples of John the Baptist, the disciples of Pharisees that Jesus was talking about in Luke, they continued their fasting because they just went, well, that's what we've always done. It's ritual to them. Jesus says, my followers, while I'm here, won't, but when I leave, they will, and then it won't be ritual. It will just be because they are religious about the disciplines of wanting to see God's power in their life. They will want to see the promise of the Spirit all around them. And that's what we want to be. We want to be people in 2023 that say, God, we want to get serious with you. We want to know your power. We're not interested in just doing church. We're not interested in just coming every Sunday and then doing ministry or whatever the case is. We're not interested, God, in doing the same thing over and over and over again. We want to be serious about following you, which means that we should get religious. We should understand there are disciplines. We should ask ourselves for 2023, what have I allowed to slip or to slide? Because tons of people love to use that phrase, it's just a relationship with Jesus, or Jesus is my friend. And what they do without knowing it is if that's the only way you define the faith is as a relationship, then what you do is you do exactly what you do with your friends. You kind of skip out on some of the disciplines, and you go, God will forgive. He's all about grace. He doesn't want me in a ritualistic pattern. And so we ignore the disciplines, but they are for our benefit. And we ignore them at our peril. And we end up spiritually leaning against mailboxes at night going, I don't know if I can do this. And it's not a good place to be, running or in the faith. So for 2023, we are pushing you as your pastoral team. We are encouraging you. We can't help you with your fitness goals. We can't help you with your nutrition goals. We can't help you with any other goals that you've set. But your spiritual ones, we want to be here for you. And so we're going, listen, let's do things differently this year. Let's not just come into this year and do the same old stuff over and over and over again. 
So we're encouraging you to ask yourself this question. What disciplines, prayer, fasting, Bible reading, spending time with the Lord, ministering to others, care, compassion, ministry, serving, whatever the case is, what religious practices have you let slide completely? And we want to see you this year make a commitment, a renewal commitment to say, I'm going to do it. And the one way that we want to help, small way, is that this whole week, every single night, 645 to 730, we're holding prayer both at our Berlin and our Crisfield campuses. If you can make it, we know that you can't make every single night. You may say, I can't because my schedule. It's fine. But if you can, join us. At both campuses, there will be a worship team. There will be a path. One of our uh, pastors will be here to lead in worship. There will be a time of personal prayer for you just to pray quietly. There will be a time of worship together. And then there will be a time of corporate prayer where one of the pastors will be here to lead you through things. But we want to provide a space this week for you to say, I'm going to start getting serious. And my schedule is going to start in the same way that you put in work, you put in dinner, you put in clothes and laundry and cleaning. We're saying, get your spiritual life in those disciplines as well. You hear me? And so, if you can make it, Monday through Friday, 645, right here or in Crisfield, join us for prayer. But more than just those five nights, because we're just doing it as an encouragement, where in your life do you need to add the disciplines back in? What have you allowed to slip or slide And it's resulted in you feeling lightheaded when it comes to your spiritual walk. Ask God about that this week as you pray. Here's the third and the final point. Renewal is also responsive. Renewal is also responsive. At some point with your resolutions, whatever it may be, if you said, I'm going to go to the gym or I'm going to start walking or running or what, at some point... You have to put the checkbook against it. Is that still a a term? Are checkbooks, does that even exist anymore? We say things in the office here, and people like Pastor Dan go, I don't even know what that is. Checkbooks, where you still like write on a note, I promise to pay this, or my bank promise. At some point, when it comes to your dedications or your New New Year's resolutions, gyms love to give you like grace periods. Join for a no sign up fee or your first month free. Whatever they give you, at some point, it comes to money. You go, I'm going to start running. Then you go, I'm going to get some shoes, or I'm going to get, I'm going to start walking, or I'm going to do this or do. At some point, there is the need for a response. At some point, you have to actually make a determination. Are you going to do this or are you not? Because you can't keep straddling the fence. When it's March 23rd, you can't still say, I'm going to do a New Year's resolution. At that point, you're out. At some point, you have to make a response. And when it comes to your faith, even God shows an incredibly visceral reaction to people who won't make a decision. Jesus tells John in the text of Revelation that he wants John to write to seven different churches. So John's writing, but it's Jesus' words. And he gets to a church in a location known as Laodicea. And Jesus tells John, hey, John, I want you to write something about them. So I want you to hear these are John's, John's writing, but I want you to hear them as Jesus' words to this church. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says this. I know your deeds. You're not cold. You're not hot. I wish you were either one of the two. Either cold or I wish you were one, but as it is, you're just lukewarm. You're sitting the fence. You won't make a decision. You won't pony up. You are just sitting idle. You're neither hot. You're neither cold. And then get this. Here it is. Here is lovable, cuddly, warm, glitter, rainbow and sparkles Jesus. The one we all go, he's my friend. Listen to his words. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Take that to the bank. That Jesus tells this church, Because you won't make a decision, because you keep failing to get serious, because you keep playing the game of religion, but you're not really serious about it, you want everybody to think you are, but you're not really, Jesus says, I want to spit you out. How's that for cuddly? 
How's that for warm? This is God getting serious. This is God saying, don't sit the fence with me. You're either in or you're out. Make a decision. Just don't sit in the middle and play games with me. We actually have a story in the Old Testament of a renewal ceremony, an actual place where people of God were brought together to talk about renewal. It's found in the book of Joshua. Joshua is the leader at the time, and he brings the Hebrews together, and he decides to talk to them about what it takes to serve God, and he's tired of the complacency that he sees in them. So he leads them through a period of reflection, and then he leads them through the religious principles that they should be doing, and then he brings them to the point of decision, and I want you to see his words. Here's what Joshua says to them. Joshua chapter 24. He says, Now fear the Lord, and serve him with all faithfulness. You have got to get rid of the gods that your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates rivers and in Egypt. You have to serve the Lord. But, catch this, get the gut level, street, plain, practical speak here that he gives to them. He says, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, If you go, "Eh, I don't know about all that kind of stuff. i got to go to church and pray. He goes, if that all that stuff is undesirable to you, he goes, then choose. Choose something. Choose a God you're going to serve. Whether it's the gods of your ancestors or the gods of the Amorites, it it will be a stupid, ridiculous decision, but at least make one. And then he says this at the very end of it. But as for me, my family, my house, We've ponied up. We've made our decision. We're going to serve them. That's a decision. He says, pick one. If you don't like serving God, then man up, stare him in the face, and say, no thank you. Or, he says, as we did in my house, then make the decision and say, we will serve you. That's a response. That's a response. And renewal if you're serious about it, requires one. You can't just be sentimental about it. You can't just kind of go, well, I'd like to be a little bit closer to God this year and then do nothing different. What are the disciplines you need to be religious about? And then make a decision to pursue them. And so next Sunday, in addition to the times this week we're going to meet together here for prayer during the night, Next Sunday will be kind of part two to this message. We're going to go through next Sunday what it takes to actually make that decision. And we're going to go through some key parts of the faith of what we should stand before God as a congregation and say, we're going to do this with you. We're going to follow you. We're going to serve you. And we're going to put some scriptures on the screen and some charges and we're going to say stand with us and we're going to lead you through some charges where you're going to personally not commit to this church you you're not going to be reading these words to us the pastors or to coastal as a church you're going to stand and say these words to god and we're going to challenge you and say read it if you mean it and if you don't mean it don't read it just stand there but make a decision this year we want to be a church that sincerely is a light to this community around us We don't want to just be a place of spiritual indifference. Father, every year we do this, and I pray that as your shepherds and leaders here in this church that we're doing this, that we're putting our due diligence behind it. I'm asking you to lead us this week individually, each person in this room, place it upon their hearts, Spirit of God, illuminate into minds and hearts this week the practices and the disciplines, not because you want us to jump through hoops, but because you know that it's for our benefit. And if we don't do it, we slip, we slide, and we fall from you. This week, share into people's hearts what you want to see them commit to you. And throughout this week, we're asking you, draw us to make that decision, I pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen.